Well, good morning, church. Um, it's weird not seeing you here in person, but I'm still glad that we get to meet um, and that we get to dive into the Word of God together this morning. It's always such a privilege to be able to do this. Well, as always, I am excited that we do get to do this, and today I pray that we walk away built up, encouraged, convicted if needed, but filled with hope. You know, many times in our lives, especially as children, we're surrounded by people who offer wisdom, who are trying to teach us right from wrong. And sometimes we listen, and sometimes we don't. Maybe we, we forget or we just think that our ways are better. But most of the time, whether it's a parent or a family member or maybe a teacher, they have a reason for why they're trying to teach us something. They see the bigger picture. And now as a father of five, I get it. You know, growing up, a lot of times, uh, we go on family vacations. We load up in the 1985 Custom Cruiser uh, and go for a journey across the freeways to get to our destination. And a lot of times, we'd go to a national park or maybe the mountains. And once we get to these places, we would just love to go explore, go hike. And a lot of times, when we go hiking, we'd be on those switchback trails with steep cliffs next to them, like at the Grand Canyon. Or we love to go find the best lookout spot, which would always be on the edge of a cliff. And it was always so much fun and so beautiful. But the only problem was that my mom did not like heights. She especially did not like heights with four kids running around. This made her very, very nervous, understandably. My mom would always constantly be warning of us, warning of, warning of, us of what was up ahead. Right? She'd be saying, steep cliff, watch your step, stay close to the other side of the trail, Grab the rail. And all these words of wisdom were spoken to us to prevent us from getting hurt. You know, when we would get near the edge of that, that lookout point and take that selfie with the Polaroid camera on these lookout points, she'd always remind us to stay back. Because she, she could see that there was a potential danger that she knew that we couldn't see. And that's wisdom. And she wanted her kids to know it. And I believe it's something that's very similar that we see in the book of Proverbs. Solomon is constantly saying to his readers, listen to me. Don't forget these words. Bind them around your neck. Store them in your heart. I can see ahead of you. And if you do these things, it could lead to this. This is wisdom from Solomon that he is offering to us. It's a plea to be heard. And the book of Proverbs is filled with so much wisdom for our lives. You know, a lot of times it tells us the wise way to live. It also tells us the foolish way to live. It's a cut-to-the-point book. And it'll tell you what a wise man does, and then it tells you immediately after what a fool does. There's so much that we can obtain from this book. There's so much great wisdom that we can apply to our lives. So today we're going to be spending some time looking at the book of Proverbs, chapter 4. But before we jump into the text this morning, I would like to open us up in some prayer. So let's pray. Father, as always, as we come before you, the God of all creation, Lord, let our hearts and our minds be stilled. Let us be reminded of the God that we are approaching. Father, still our minds and our hearts and let our gaze be upon you. Lord, I pray as we dive into your word this morning, Lord, that we see your truth. I pray and ask by the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord, that you speak through me today that these are not words of me, God, but of the living God, and for your word to go out and do the purpose that you have planned for today, Lord. So we ask that you guide us, lead us, open our eyes to your truth. It is in your mighty name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Amen. We'll go, go ahead and grab your Bibles. We'll be in chapter 4, verses 20 through 27. It says, My son, be attentive to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Let them not escape from your sight. Keep them within your heart. For they are life to those who find them, and healing to all their flesh. Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it it flow the springs of life. Put away from you crooked speech, and put devious talk far from you. Let your eyes look directly forward, and your gaze be straight before you. Ponder the path of your feet, then all your ways will be sure. Do not swerve to the right or to the left. Turn your foot away from evil. 
Well, right away you can see the importance of what is about to be shared in Solomon's words. And he tells his readers this. Solomon is telling his son to pay close attention. Be alert, be watchful, be observant. He says, don't let these words escape from you. Don't forget this. This was so important that he was telling him to put these words of wisdom into his heart. He was telling him to protect this wisdom that was being offered. He says, son, what I'm about to give you, go put it in a safe and lock it up. Guard it. Don't let anyone take it and don't forget where you put it. Think about what's important to you. Do you have something maybe of some physical value or that might be precious to you? And if you do, what do you do to protect it? Maybe you have some old jewelry that was passed down and you keep it in a safe. Maybe you have that Tony Gwynn rookie card in the best plastic case you can find. Think about your kids and think about all that we do to protect and keep them safe. Or maybe you have that new iPhone 20 and the case you put on it costs more than the phone. But think about the time, the money, and the effort that we use to be proactively protecting these things a lot. I know personally I spend a lot of time, effort, and research on pursuing a healthy lifestyle for my physical heart, which is a good thing, and I believe it's a wise thing to do. But what if I actually spent that same amount of time trying to protect my spiritual heart? Seriously, what would that look like? That is why when we come across texts like this, we need to lean into them, to be attentive, and to listen to the words, that, words of wisdom that is about to be offered. Because it's powerful words like these that can shape our life and influence our hearts. Taking words of wisdom into our hearts is vital. All of our thoughts and words and choices flow from the heart. And he's telling us this in verse 23. He says, keep our hearts with all vigilance, for from it flow the, wellspring, for from it flow the springs of life. Another translation says, to guard our hearts, for it's the wellspring of life. He's saying, listen, above all else, one of the most important things we can do is to guard our hearts. Our hearts are very important. They're the center of our existence and the evil one attempts to attack it. So we must learn to guard and to protect our hearts. We need to learn to know our hearts. We need to learn to know what troubles our hearts. Our hearts are like a reservoir. And if our reservoir is polluted, it makes no sense to fix things, fix things downstream and attempts to clean it. We would need to address it at the source of the problem, at the reservoir, at the heart. We need to observe what is actually going into a reservoir. Are we doing anything to protect what is coming into it? Any sort of filtration system? What about some boundaries of what we actually allow to flow into it? Listen, we have to be diligent. We've ha we have to protect and fight for our hearts. If my heart is polluted and is captured by sin, then my affections, desires, and pursuits are going to follow. Just like if the reservoir is polluted, then the water is going to be polluted downstream. We're called to be proactive in this fight against our sin. Not just meander through it or attempt behavior of modification, the attempt to try and fix things on the outside. Right? We can only play whack-a-mole for so long. And if I'm just trying to fix things on the outside, that ugly sin in my heart is going to continue to pop up in other areas of my life. And until I'm honest with myself and deal with it at the source, my heart will continue to remain polluted. We have to protect our hearts. We have to protect our hearts against sin. The Bible is extremely clear on why this is so important. But before we go into why it is so important, I think it'd be good for us just to remind ourselves of what sin is according to the Bible. Sin is disobedience to God. Sin is choosing our own will over God's will for our life. When, we're, when we sin, we are actually turning towards ourselves and not towards God. Or as John Piper puts it, sin is what you do when your heart is not satisfied with God. So why do we need to protect our hearts from sin? Why does this even matter? Well, Paul's words in Romans tells us why. Romans 6, 23, it says, For the wages of sin is death. And in Romans 8, 13, he says, For if you live according to the flesh, if you do what you want to do, if you live according to the flesh, you will die. These are serious words, and they're not soft. 
They're a loud warning. And Paul is stri- very straight to the point. And he has a very similar tone as Solomon has in Proverbs. We need to hear these warnings and take them seriously. We need to be attentive to his words. Because listen, sin can cause you to lose your job. It can cause you to get kicked out of school. It can cause you to do things you don't want to do. It can divide families. It can lead to brokenness, pain, and sorrow, and eventually will lead to death. And it separates us from God. We serve a holy God who hates sin, and we need to hate it too. But unfortunately, though, sometimes as Christians, we don't. We don't run from it, we run to it. We don't fight it, we hug it. We have to be serious about our sin or it's going to lead to death. Right? You can only play with fire for so long before it eventually burns you. Like John Owen says, the famous quote, be killing sin or it will be killing you. Now I want you to know that I am completely preaching to myself today. By no means have I come to a place of arrival on this. It's a constant battle that I have to be fighting for daily. I have to be constantly protecting my heart against sin. You see, the struggle that I sometimes have is that I believe the lie that sin is better than the promises of God. And to be honest, though, in my young years as a Christian, this was tough for me. I was saved in my early 20s, and I was living it up. I thought that as I had to give up, I thought that as I gave up these sinful habits, that I was actually going to be missing out. I thought that I was giving something up. I thought that I wouldn't be happy if I didn't get to do these things anymore. I thought that what this world had to offer was so much greater. I was actually believing the lie that I thought I was losing something. But in all reality, I wasn't losing anything. I was gaining everything. Jesus says in John 15, 11, he says, these words I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Psalm 1611 says, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. And continuing Paul's words in Romans, in those verses we just read, Romans 6.23 says, Yes, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. In Romans 8.13, he says, Yes, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die, but if by the Spirit you put the death, the deeds of the body, you will live. Don't believe the lie that leads to death. Believe and hear the truth that leads to life. Christian, don't dabble in your sin. Don't play in your sin. Don't get comfortable in your sin. Sin is deceitful. It looks good. It tastes good and it feels good. But in the end, it leads to death. Listen, it's like a donut with pink frosting and sprinkles all over it. Right? It looks amazing. And it probably tastes even better. But for me, in about 20 or 30 minutes, I'm going to regret that I ate that thing. My body is not going to be stoked that I ate it. Now, there's nothing wrong with donuts, especially maple bars, right? But my body just doesn't get along with them. I know that I'm not going to feel good later on, but I'm still tempted to eat them because they're good. And it's the same thing with sin, right? It looks good. It tastes good. It tricks us. It deceives us, and it blinds us. This is what happened to Adam and Eve in the garden. The fruit looked good, and they were enticed by it. And at that moment, it looked better than God. They believed the lie. And if we truly believe, if we, if we truly believe the consequences of our sin, will we still engage in it? Well, sometimes we do know the consequences of our sin, and we still choose to pursue it. In Mark chapter 9, verses 43 through 47, Jesus is very clear and straight to the point on this. He says, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell, to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell. Jesus commonly taught by using word pictures. He would exaggerate language to make strong points. The point here is not to literally cut off your hand or your foot or gouge out your eye, but to take your sin seriously. If there are things in your life that are causing you to sin, cut those things off. Get rid of them. If something is causing you to sin, then we need to stop doing it. We need to be on our guard, right? If your cell phone or your computer device is causing you to sin, then get rid of it. 
If going to a certain place is causing you to sin, stop going there. If a group of friends at school is tempting you to sin and do things you don't want to do, then maybe don't hang with them anymore. But listen, doing these things aren't going to purify us or safeguard us 100%. They're not. We're still going to stumble and still fall short. Setting up safe boundaries doesn't save us or get rid of that sin, but we are guarding ourselves. We're being proactive in protecting our hearts. But by not doing these things, we're setting ourselves up for failure. Listen, don't walk aimlessly into the lion's den thinking you're not going to get bit. Right? We play these games to see how far we can get. We push the limits every time. And then when we get caught, we don't like to take responsibility for our actions. We point our finger like Adam and Eve did. James 1, 13 through 15 says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. It is myself that leads me to sin. No one else. It's Casey. Yes, my enemy is out there throwing the beta temptation out in front of me, but I am the one who chooses to run into sin. Sin doesn't run into me. It was like King David, right? That dude willfully walked right into temptation. He saw Bathsheba bathing, and he could have turned away, but he didn't. He fixed his eyes on what he wanted and not on God. His gaze was off. And then there was Joseph, who did the complete opposite of David, right? He was constantly being pursued by Potiphar's wife, but he kept refusing and even said, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And then one day she had him cornered. She finally thought she had him. But what did he do? Did he give in to temptation? No. That dude ran, literally. He took off. And that's what we need to do. Let's not be like King David and walk into our sin. Let's be like Joseph and run from our sin. Because listen, pleasures and, sed pleasures and seductions of temptation try to draw us away from the narrow road. They're begging for our attention as they attempt to take our gaze off of God and onto them. Temptation comes through our eyes, our second look, whether it's coveting that new car or maybe an opportunity to gossip about someone to make yourself look better or maybe taking a glance at that inappropriate image. What we do with our eyes and what we do with our gaze matters. If Adam and Eve would have looked straight ahead, they would have seen God and not the fruit. If David had kept his eyes straight ahead on the Lord, he would have not pursued Bathsheba. If the rich ruler would have taken his eyes off his earthly treasure, he would have seen that Jesus was offering him an eternal treasure. There are so many examples when others let their eyes turn to the left and to the right. We need to fix our eyes on Jesus, our author and perfecter of our faith. Psalm 119, 37 says, Turn my eyes, turn my eyes from looking at worthless things and give me life in your ways. That's where our eyes need to be. If our eyes are fixed on him, we can turn and run from temptation and we can guard our hearts. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, no, temp no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with, temp but with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. We need to endure and fight but if we don't know how to fight against sin and temptation, then we need to look to the manual. We need to look at our Bible and see what it says. And Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18, he says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, and against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and his shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith which, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, 
praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. We need to put on our armor. You can't play in the game if you don't put your equipment on, right? If you walk onto the football field and don't put your helmet on, you're going to get whacked in the head, right? We just can't wander onto the field. We have to put on our equipment, Christian. So grab your shield of faith and your sword and fight for this and do it daily. Because listen, it's, it's not a playground. It's a battlefield. We just can't wander around picking daisies, right? Our enemy is trying to take us out, and we need to be ready. He's going after our heart. 1 Peter 5.8 says, Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. We have to be looking out for this. We have to be ready. Well, like I said, every summer we love to take trips as a family. And one summer we took a trip to Yellowstone National Park, which is filled with so much wildlife and just beautiful scenery and things to do. And I remember we got there, and so one day we decided to take another hike. And I think it was called Elephant Trail, but it was totally weird because I didn't see any elephants on it. But anyways, a lot of times when you go on hikes in Yellowstone, it's not uncommon to see bears, right? They're everywhere. So they have all these recommendations that you can actually do to deter bears, and one of these recommendations is to make a lot of noise. So here we are, the Barnes family, hiking through this pristine, quiet, beautiful forest, dad leading the way, and we've got bells ringing, everyone's clapping, and we're yelling to one another. I mean, can you even imagine what this would have looked like? It was probably quite the scene. But guess what, though? We might have looked foolish, but we didn't see any bears. We knew, though, that they were out there, right? They were out there. But we were given the tools to be proactive to deter them. We were doing these things really in faith to push the bears away before we even saw them. And it's the same thing we need to do to safeguard our hearts from sin. We need to be proactive with our spiritual weapons in hand. And this is how Jesus handled it. Our Savior, Jesus Christ, was tempted by the evil one. He just spent 40 days fasting, and I'm guessing he was pretty hungry and tired and maybe seemed to be in a position of weakness because of that. Now, I believe it's important for us to understand the context of that, right? Because a lot of times when we give in to temptation or sin or just let our guard down, it's usually in a time when we're tired, anxious or stressed or just or emotional. So this text should give us hope. You see, when Jesus was tempted, when the Son of God was tempted, he didn't call out, for cosmic powers or an army of angels. He didn't hit or kick or use any physical force. He totally could have, but he didn't. Instead, when he was tempted three times, he answered with what Paul told us to use in Ephesians 6, the sword, the word of God. He quoted scripture because he knew scripture. Psalm 119, nine verses, verses nine through 11, says, how can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Listen, if we don't know scripture, then we're not going to know how to use it. We're not going to know how to use a sword. It's going to be inefficient, right? We need to have an arsenal of verses at hand. So that when it comes time, because there is going to be a time, to fight against temptation or sin, we actually have a weapon to use. So grab your sword and cut off the false promise of sin with an authoritative promise of God. If you're feeling fearful or defeated, how about Isaiah 41.10? Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. What about tempted with anger? Proverbs 29.11 says, a fool gives full vent to his spirit, but a wise man quietly holds it back. Maybe you've got lust creeping at your door. Grab Matthew 5, 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. What about when guilt is trying to weigh you down? We preach Romans 8, 1 to ourselves. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Have God's promises at hand to fight temptation when it rises up because it will. We need to know the word. I love what John Piper's mom wrote in his Bible when he was a kid. She wrote, this book will keep you from sin, or sin will keep you from this book. Well, let me give you another example. My, my wife and I have now been married for 14 years, 
And I remember early, in our early years of marriage, after a disagreement or an argument, or if I had sinned against her, I would always go to the book of Ephesians, chapter 5, to remind myself on how the Lord calls me to love and to lead her. And that was a good thing to do. But what I've learned over the years is that I shouldn't wait for something to happen and then go to the Word to remind myself of how to love my bride. But it's actually something that I need to be filling my mind with daily. Because, listen, my pride will rise up. There will be days when I fall short and I get argumentative. But now when that happens, I have the Word of God in my pocket. It's fresh on my mind. It's stored in my heart. So when temptation arises for me to want to be right, because that happens, I now think about how Christ loves his bride and the church. And yes, sometimes I still say the wrong thing or I give goofball looks, but because the word is in my heart, I'm quicker to confess and repent and praise God for that. So yes, we're called to be proactive. We're called to fight against temptation and sin. We're called to run from our sin and to slay it. We as Christians, I believe, have the responsibility to be actively pursuing God and turning from our sin. But I just can't do this in the strength of Casey. I can't. Romans 8, verses 5 and 6 says, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. We need our eyes and our minds fixed on the Spirit, on our Savior, on our God. And going back to Proverbs 4, verses 25 through 27, he says, Let your eyes look directly forward, your gaze be straight before you. Ponder the path of your feet. Then all your ways will be sure. Don't swerve to the right or to the left. Turn your foot away from evil. Lord, help me keep my eyes on you. If I take my eyes off the road when I'm driving, I'm going to swerve, right? I'm probably going to hit something. And that's why they put those rumble strips on the shoulders and on that center divider, right, to warn us that we're drifting, And if we ignore it, we're going to go off the road, right? We're probably going to get in an accident. Those rumble strips are there to wake us up. They're a warning sign to get our attention, to get us to focus straight ahead. And if we want to guard our hearts, if if we want to kill our sin, then let our gaze be straight ahead on him. Let our minds be fixed on the promises of God. I'll be honest, there have been a lot of times in my walk as a Christian, though, that I felt defeated. I felt like I was never going to be able to overcome this sin, or that one, which is kind of right because I really don't have the power to do it in my own strength. But thankfully, I don't have to rely on my own strength, right? Because this life is no longer mine. I'm now a follower of Christ. And being a follower of Christ, my life is now his, right? Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Yes, Jesus Christ was beaten, mocked, spitting on, and was eventually crucified. He died and they put him in a tomb, and they thought they won. But three days later, Jesus Christ rose from the grave, conquering the power of sin and death. And that is the God who lives within us, Jesus Christ. 1 John 4.4 says, Little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. In Romans chapter 8, verses 31 through 34, says, What should we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is a condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised and who is at the right hand of God, who indeed indeed is interceding for us. Jesus said, whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but in light. These are truths that we need to believe. These are biblical truths from the word of God, so store them in your heart. Use them to guard your heart. You are a new identity in Christ. His work on the cross was sufficient and it covered all of your sin. You are a child of God and you've been adopted into his family. C.S. Lewis said, sin once controlled, once controlled our hearts, but the invasion of God's forgiveness has brought us into a new life of forgiveness and peace. So ask yourself, what can we do today? How can we guard our hearts today? And if needed, how can we shift of how we're pursuing the Lord? 
Well, I encourage you to just start with pressing into Jesus' words in Matthew twenty two thirty seven. He said to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. Just start there. Love the Lord. Delight yourself in the Lord. Psalm 37, 4 says, delight yourself in the Lord, and he gives you the desires of your heart. If you're not finding joy in serving the Lord and sin is looking better, then get on your knees in prayer and ask him to change your heart. Ask him to give you a hatred towards your sin. Ask him to give you a greater desire to follow him. Be real, be honest, humble yourself. Confess that sin to the Lord and be set free. Let the light shine in those dark areas in your heart. And find people that you can be vulnerable with. Don't believe that you can do this on your own because we can't. Our hearts can be so deceitful. We need one another. I know where my heart can go and how fast it can happen. And this is why I believe we need to take Hebrews 3 so seriously. Verses 12 through 13 says, Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort, encourage one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Sin is deceitful. We can't see it, right? Sin clouds our vision, and it's tough to see God when we're walking in it. We need one another, and God has given us the gift of fellowship. We need the support, the prayer, and the accountability. We can't run this race in our own strength. We need others to be observing our lives as well. I can only drive around for so long in my truck with my maintenance light on and just believe in it's just for an oil change, right? That light comes on for a reason. And I can be naive and just think, it's just for another oil change. But what if it's something bigger? I'm not going to look under the hood. I don't want to do that. I'm afraid it's either going to cost too much money or I'm just too prideful and think that nothing's wrong. But here's the thing, though. If there's a warning light going off, it needs to be examined. I need to get it to John's shop, right, for him to take an honest look and to speak the truth about it. I need him to help me find the root and tell me what's causing that light to go on. And it's the same thing with our lives. We need to be praying for one another. We need to be encouraging one another with the word of God daily so that we can guard our hearts. Well, as we close today, ask yourself, am I guarding my heart? And if not, then what do I need to do to guard my heart against? Listen, sometimes it feels like an uphill battle. But remember that the battle has already been won. It is finished. We serve a mighty God who is the creator of all things, who spoke everything into existence. He made the earth. He shaped the mountains. He established the heavens. He assigned the sea its limits. He breathed life into Adam's lungs. And he sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ, out of love to lay his life down for our sake so that we may live. There is no one like our God. Well, let me close this with 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 23 through 24. It says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, and he will surely do it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your truth. God, we thank you that you have given us your word. Father, that you have revealed your promises to us, Lord, and that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, Lord, as a sacrifice for our sake. Lord, I pray as we hear these words today that we're filled with hope, God, that we're reminded that you have been, that you've rescued us, Lord, from a pit of darkness and you firmly placed our feet upon the rock of salvation. Lord, I pray for these truths to be stored in our hearts so that when sin attempts to arise, Lord, we can fight against it and keep our eyes on our God, our Savior. Lord, we thank you again so much for this time. Lord, we love you. We pray these things in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.